this lecture, we are going to be looking at uh, a couple different concepts in early uh, anthropology, first and foremost being this notion of craniometry, or how do we measure the human skeleton. Um, and then we'll be looking at a debate that occurred during the 19th century, um, really kind of uh, in the backdrop of all of the um, kind of build up to the American Civil War, uh, through the Civil War and afterwards. Um, it's this whole notion of polygenism versus versus monogenism, right? Was there one creation event in which God created all uh, living creatures on earth at once, or were there multiple creation events in which God created creatures multiple times on earth? Um, so it kind of gives you an idea that they're still framing things within this uh, religious argument, right? So they're still trying to find this historical uh, accuracy for the Bible. But um, it's important to know that at that time, you know, you had uh, a lot of contemporaries like Jeff Thomas Jefferson, Linnaeus, as well as um, Abraham Lincoln that all argued for a different evolutionary path for, our, for Africans, or at the very least um, for this notion of white supremacy, that white people should be given the reigns to rule and govern, whereas um, people of color are kind of relegated to um, labor roles. So we're going to be looking at a few prominent figures that kind of talked about those kind of things. You know, it seems a bit ridiculous to us um, nowadays, or, you know, how blatantly racist it is to us nowadays. Um, but this was essentially the prevailing thought at the, uh, at the time. So craniometry is this um, notion of measuring the skull, right? Or um, sometimes referred to or originally referred to as phrenology, right? So it, uh, it kind of became a scientific way to distinguish between human groups. So in essence, what these scientists were doing is they were running around robbing graves all over the place to um, acquire these skulls, right? And taking different measurements of skull as well as doing it on live people, um, all to kind of cement this idea or to kind of push their argument of polygenism or monogenism, right? So if they were a polygenist, their notion was to create a separate ancestry for non-white people. If they were monogenous, it was to create a scale of intelligence based on skull size, which places um, people of Caucasian descent on top. So in essence, what they're doing is trying to kind of prove this evolutionary link between Africans and um, apes, essentially. Or kind of making these comparisons of subgroups like the um, round-headed savage Prussian type with the gentle long-headed Teuton type, right? Kind of even making distinguishing um, characteristics or distinguishing categories within um, individual cultures like the kind of German cultures. This actually comes out of a... Um, uh, book that um, was sat on uh, Adolf Hitler's uh, bookshelf. So let's look at some prominent American monogenus versus polygenus here real quick. Uh, of course, we already talked about this. Um, I'm not sure if we've brought him up yet, but you will in uh, subsequent lectures. A gentleman named Samuel Morton, who lived from 1799 to 1851, he sought to prove that relative racial categories um, exist based on brain size. Um, he was one of the first to propose that skull measurements can strictly determine uh, intelligence via brain size. He used Egyptian, Native American, Europe European as well as Asian skulls and Caucasian skulls, and made assertions based off of a very, very small sample size. And what we notice over time in subsequent studies of um, kind of Morton's work is that the we call it the creeping mean of the Africans, that the average brain size or average skull size for Africans began to slowly creep down over time. Um, he was an ardent monogenous, and really essentially where did Morton go wrong? Well, Morton went wrong in terms of fudging his numbers, right? So if we look at kind of uh, these, uh, you know, number of skulls that were used, um, you can see that the large degree of them were Native American skulls, um, and there are only a few uh, Ethiopian skulls, right? Those are the African skulls. So really, in essence, his kind of um, original studies were based off of such a small sample size that statistically it can't make any type of statement, uh, or at least any type of valid statement against um, or a statement about humans as a whole. So Morton failed essentially in four regards, right? He shifted subcategories within his study, for example, dropping Hindu skulls from the Caucasian sample to alter the mean when Hindus are actually um, part of the Caucasian uh, quote-unquote group. 
Uh, the use of materials was biased. He used seeds, which always produced the expected results that he wanted. It was a lack of consideration, such as uh, or consideration of variables such as sex and age. He just grabbed random skulls. He didn't even make sure they were all adults. So we know that skull size will dramatic, uh, vary dramatically based on what age you are. Um, and he, mi he miscalculated where it suited him, right? Rounding down averages for Africans, whereas he rounded up averages for Caucasians, right? So why was this bad math not called out when it was published, right? Well, this was kind of really supporting a huge cultural notion of African inferiority. We also have another prominent figure at the time named Louis Agassiz. Some of you may um, actually come across him in your biology classes. Um, he was actually a prominent paleontologist. Um, he was educated in Zurich, Heidelberg, and Munich. Um, he had influence over of um, Cuvier, um, von Humboldt, and Oaken, right? Uh, he received his PhD in 1829 and an MD in 1830. He published The Fishes of Brazil in 1829, as well as Poseidon Faciles in 1833, um, culminating in republishing the work in 1843. He was a professor of natural history at the Lyceum in Neuchâtel. Um, so in essence, he was a very big prominent figure in the paleontology world. And later on in his career, he really started to weigh in on this debate about human uh, categorization and human intelligence. So I, Agassiz uh, argued for polygenism before migrating to America in 1840. After living in America, he kind of twisted this notion of polygenism to support uh, racial inferiority ideologies, right? He cited and supported Samuel Morton's work on Egyptian Native American skull measurements, um, whereas he cited his work, he did not agree in Morton's kind of monogenist um, conclusions, right? He really just kind of um, used it as uh, physical measurements to kind of prove the notion that people of color were inferior. Um, and he actually was prominent within the Lincoln administration to inform uh, on the condition or on public services to be extended to freed slaves, right? So it kind of makes you shudder a little bit to think that someone like this who is ardently racist um, was in charge of actually creating public uh, services for um, recently freed slaves. Uh, Agassiz, um, who was a famous geologist as well, uh, toppled from his perch here at Stanford University during a 1906 um, earthquake. And uh, this was actually um, preceding the uh, fires that followed the quake, which leveled San Francisco, which turned into a catastrophic event, right? And they actually never put Agassiz's statue um, back up uh, in the same place that it fell from. So the question was, is why was phrenology not championed more by the South, right? Many phrenologists at the time, or many prominent phrenologists, were polygenists, right? And polygenists refutes the literal translations of the Bible that were held amongst a lot of prominent religions in the South of the United States. Most Southerners followed this philosophy of degeneration, right? That uh, people of color were degenerated descendants of the sons of Noah, right? So in essence, after that big flood that happened in the Bible, uh, Noah's sons went off. One of them was a bad son and one of them was a good son. The good son, all the descendants from that became Caucasians and things like that. Uh, all of the quote unquote good races and uh, the sons of the bad uh, son of Noah or the descendants all became the kind of people of color throughout the uh, world, right? So in essence, the Southern philosophy placed people of color as the furthest away from God and, and whites as the quote unquote closest to God, right? And this is what kind of acted as kind of a social um, legitimacy to the kind of the horrors of the slave trade and the horrors of the condition of slavery in the South. But they did love a guy named Josiah Knott. Josiah Knott traveled, and we talked about him before, around the South giving lectures on the separate nature of Africans and African Americans. Josiah's research was used as a scientific justification for the Southern institution of slavery. And Knott, as well as Agassiz, asserted that facial prognathism is a clear indicator of evolutionary stage, right? So they assumed that most Africans, from their pitifully small sample sizes, had this large degree of facial prognathism. Which is very interesting because you really can only determine so much uh, facial prognathism or how much the face sticks away from the rest of the skull from the actual skull measurements, right? There's a lot of flesh on your face and your flesh has a little bit of degree and variation in terms of its deposition. This is just showing you uh, some of the kind of uh, images that came out of Josiah Knott's work.
So let's take a uh, brief moment to look at some of the prominent uh, European races. We have um, Carlos Linnaeus, right? We talked about him, created one of the first racial classification systems for humans. We have Johann Blumenbach, who added to Linnaeus' system by creating additional racial categories and cemented the notion of race as a scientific subject over the notion of Linnaeus' subspecies. Then, of course, we have David Hume, who uh, whites were considered separate species, and only one was capable of civilized society, right? So in essence, he looked at all of the quote-unquote different cultures of the world and determined that it was only people who were white that were considered um, capable of civilizing to the extent, right? It wasn't, you know, circumstance. It wasn't colonialism, right? It wasn't anything that kind of uh, any of these other social, natural, and environmental factors that led to um, the development of European civilization. And he also discounted the wide degree of civilizations that were in the you know, complex civilizations that were seen in Africa, Asia, and South America. If we look at another individual, we have Paul Broca, who is the father of craniometry as well as criminology. He's a French scholar who was influenced by Samuel Morton's work and a prominent polygenist. He argued that French brains were superior to other European nations based on his um, measurements, and he said he supported the notion that brain size directly equals intelligence. And Broca's studies on craniometry were not statistically incorrect. Instead, he cherry-picked data, right? So he championed this notion of a cephalic index, which is brain height compared to width, right? So um, Broca's studies weren't inaccurate per se. What he did was he cherry picked certain elements of his statistics that supported his already preconceived notions that people of color were lower intelligence and that within the European arena um, of wh white individuals, uh, you know, certain nations were of greater intelligence than others. Broca's most popular study is the study that tried to prove um, French superiority in terms of intelligence. Uh, so he sought to prove European superiority biologically and culturally over other cultures as well. He obtained 4,500 skeletons from Parisian cemeteries, so a very, very large sample size. Um, and he conducted cranial measurements on them and concluded there was a steady increase in brain size in European populations over time, right? And um, in essence, yes, he did. Um, there was an increase in brain size over time, but that is a pattern that we see in human populations in general and is really heavily based off of um, the kind of degree in which uh, how good your diet is, right? So um, remember back to Franz Boas' study on Ellis Island where he talked about or kind of concluded that, you know, it, really, it was really the American diet which caused Americans to have larger than European body sizes, right? And that goes along with the skull. So as diets improve over time, as food systems improve over time, time, European brain sizes are going to improve over time. Human brain sizes are going to increase over time, right? Um, so again, in this instance, the data was cherry-picked, and in essence, what he did is he dropped any outliers to his data, which in some instances in kind of smaller statistical studies, it's not abnormal to drop outliers, but when you're doing a very large study like this on something like uh, human brain size or intelligence or making kind of these uh, very important assertions here, um, you don't really want to uh, drop any outliers. You want to be able to consider those outliers and how they play into the natural variation of the human species. If we look at other Broca studies, we have the study called Heavy Criminal Brains, right, where he measured the skulls of criminals and concluded that criminals may have been deviants due to increased cerebral activity. We also have sex comparison studies where he compared the cranial capacity of men and women, and this was done to cement racial superiority, asserting that a man of the black race's brain is no heavier than that of a white woman. Right. And this was kind of still during a time when women were placed on kind of a lower scale of inferiority than white men. Um, and we also have the students of Broca went on to create studies which cherry picked data to support racial superiority of whites, less intelligence in women and the innate criminality of certain peoples. Even Maria Montessori, right, who is kind of a champion of a, in, in, you know, kind of a very unique and very um, beneficial education system that we use today. Uh, Maria Montessori herself was born in uh, Rome, 
in August of 30th, 1870. In 1896, she became the first female doctor in Italy. After uh, medical school, she specialized in psychiatry. She began working with disabled children and noticed some significant developmental periods where children learn things most easily, right? She opened the Casa dei Bambini, or the children's house in the slums of Rome, which is a place where she educated children. She died in May 6th, 1952, but her legacy lives on in kind of educational policies all over the world. So if we look at some of her um, key components of the Montessori method, it is that you are supposed to respect each child, make each child the center of learning, encourage children to learn by providing freedom, <clears throat> observe children, uh, observe them closely, prepare the learning environment so the children can operate freely within the learning environment, introduce multi-sensory learning materials, right? You want both visual as well as auditory, as well as uh, tactile learning tools, right? And auto education, right? Which is the main goal of this method, right? To teach children how to educate themselves about the world around them. So coming from Maria Montessori's mouth, the whole of mankind is only one and only one race, one class and one society, right? So it's really interesting how Maria Montessori kind of started her studies, um, you know, kind of as a student of Broca, but as kind of culture changed, as the tools of science changed, by the time she kind of ended her life, she was um, kind of quite the opposite of a racist, right? Um, she said that Broca and Lombroso has shown that the proclivities of the criminal can be predicted using the brain, right? So that comes out of one of her earlier studies. So moving on, we look at uh, Cesare Lombroso, right, which is um, kind of the father of modern criminology. He was an army physician and a psychiatry professor um, in criminal anthropology, right? Uh, he kind of supported this notion of integrated positivism or evolutionism, right? It's the relationship of the crime to the body. Uh, and he really wrote a lot about something called the criminal man, right? Trying to get this essence of what makes an individual a criminal, right? He sought to make criminology and modern science uh, with looking into the investigation of causes of crime rather than kind of prevention of crime. So he kind of came up with these um, several concepts within criminology. He looked at uh, replaced free will versus determinism, right? Uh, I, whether someone is born a criminal, whether they are considered a lower life form, whether they are closer to ape-like ancestors, and they are both kind of traits versus dispositions. He also looked at the atavistic stimagda, right, which is the physical features, earlier stage of development, and becoming fully human, right? So what Lombroso is really trying to do, and in the essence of looking at all these different intersections and these different traits within criminals, was trying to prove that the criminal itself, that people who were criminals, are somehow less evolved than people who were not criminals, right? So he looked at different physical characteristics and said that criminals have huge jaws and strong canine teeth. Um, the, there was something called a born female criminal, uh, otherwise known as the prostitute in Lombroso's eyes. Um, he kind of was the first to introduce criminal uh, or clinical criminology, uh, which is to categorize and classify different types of criminals. Um, and he was the first to create a criminal typology, right? He had different criminal types, like uh, criminals who were born to be criminals, criminals who became insane and then became criminals. And he also had criminaloids, right, which were kind of people who evolved into criminals, right? And we kind of chuckle, or I kind of say these things lightly um, now with uh, kind of Lombroso's studies, but, you know, he kind of um, had an interesting aspect in how he looked at criminality, right? Um, he, for the insane criminal, they were not insane from birth, right? Um, they had a change in the brain somewhere during life that interferes with the ability to determine right from wrong. Criminaloids were kind of this ambiguous group who evolved into these criminals that they had these habitual criminal behaviors or they became criminals by passion. Um, he also had diverse types of criminaloids, right, which were epileptic criminaloids or occasional criminaloids, right? And this is essentially just saying um, whether they were habitual criminals versus non habitual criminals. So the objectives of punishment should be for the protection of society as well the, of the improvement of the criminal, and it should be individualized, um, which is kind of interesting. So Lombroso went on to kind of propose this uh, criminal uh, reformation system that really focused on individualized rehabilitation for individuals, right? And it, which kind of turned out to be a little bit unrealistic in terms of, you know, actual 
uh, criminal justice system, but um, it's kind of an interesting notion. Um, we also have uh, Gabriel Tarde, uh, who was actually a contemporary of Lombroso. Um, he was one of the earliest to propose a sociological theory. He rejected this notion of ab uh, biological abnormality, and he asserted that normal people, in essence, learned crime, and others uh, will learn legitimate trades, right? So what Gabriel Tarde was um, arguing was quite the opposite of Lombroso, right? Lombroso said that criminality was innate, right? As well as intelligence being innate. Uh, Tarde, on the other hand, said that, the, well, there were sociological factors and environmental factors that led to people becoming criminals, right? We, we learned crime. We do not, we are not born criminals. We learn how to become criminals. So if we look at this atavism, um, which became kind of a center feature of um, uh, kind of Lombroso's study, is this modification of a biological structure whereby an ancestral trait reappears after having been lost through evolutionary change in previous generations. So Lombroso asserted this was kind of how the innate nature of a criminal existed, how you could have families in which, you know, the fathers, the grandparents were not criminals, but all of a sudden the children were, right? So this is how, um, it's this notion of atavism, right? And he discovered that through looking at the brigand uh, the Hello skull, and he said it contained atavistic features that were not part of his other family. So what does it matter with this... Um, notion of atavism with Lombroso's research. And what he was really was um, from kind of his own uh, writings, he says a series of atavistic features recalling an apish past rather than a human present. So what Lombroso is really trying to do is trying to create this uh, system of measurement in which you can figure out how, much, how you know, what the degree of facial pragmatism is and these other kind of atavistic features. Um, you know, there were a couple like a big bump on the back of the skull, um, you know, how wide the skull is, things like that. Um, and he was trying to prove that one, you can prove that based on these measurements that someone is most likely going to be a criminal and even further, you can prove that those people are not as evolved as non-criminals. And even when, you know, even further to kind of associate this with race, saying that, you know, most people who are criminals are people of color within these societies, um, and that that is because they have a more uh, lower evolutionary trend than, than let's say, non-criminal white people, quote unquote. Um, so we know today that this is absolutely ridiculous, that there is no such thing as an atavistic feature, um, and that atavistic, quote unquote, features do not um, correspond to any notions of criminality or anything like that. So during this time period, I'm hoping that by this point you've gotten to read these chapters within the uh, Mismeasure of Man book. Um, but what we see during this period is kind of a shifting status of colored persons and quote unquote uh, societal undesirables. Um, originally, kind of towards the start of the 19th century, we had this notion that people of color were originally thought to be more closely related to apes. But once you kind of had evolutionary theory starting to come out and some of these kind of subsequent studies, we started to realize that, well, you know, people of color are most likely human, just like everybody else. Um, you yeah, know, shocking. Uh, so it's it's kind of, you know, ridiculous to us today, but this is really, you know, where we started at the early 19th century. Century. And then as we kind of uh, got into the kind of scientific recognition that, you know, people of color were in fact humans, um, it started to get into this notion of, well, now we need to measure these uh, features of intelligence and prove that people of color are on a lower scale than, than white people. Um, so they began to shift to, well, an adult African male is now um, kind of below average intelligence of a white woman, right? Um, and then it further shifted as we got kind of close to the end of the 19th century to this notion of, well, now they're kind of uh, at the same level as children intellectually of uh, quote, superior races. And this was kind of applied to both Africans, Native Americans, as well as Asians, right? And it just kind of shows you this kind of um, racist history that science has had in terms of, at least in the social sciences, trying to prove, you know, trying to create these classification systems where one group is on top of the other. We know today that this is all a bit ridiculous. Um, we know today that there's a wide degree of variation in terms of intelligence um, between populations of humans and within populations of humans. And that intelligence and the development of intelligence is really very widely um, kind of associated with this notion of environment, right? It's that whole, uh, 
you know, nurture aspect of nature versus nurture. Yes, every human is born with a certain degree of intelligence, but it's really what happens after that birth that really determines how smart or how intelligent a person is going to be, right? You can have an, or very, uh, you know, you can have a child that displays kind of a high degree of innate intelligence, but if that innate intelligence is not nurtured, then those, you know, that innateness will be lost over time, right? It's really that nurturing of intelligence or the development of intelligence through environment and teaching and rearing and things like that that really determine an individual's intellectual ilk. Right. So there really is no reality to this notion that we can put, uh, you know, races uh, or even different groups of humans on the scale of intelligence based on any type of physical measurement. So let's take a brief look at craniometry, which is the measurement of the skull. Um, it originally started as kind of this uh, notion of phrenology in 1800 with Franz Gall, who suggested that bumps of the skull represented different mental abilities, right? So depending on the size of your bumps will determine how smart you are in a certain uh, mental capacity. His theory though, uh, incorrect, uh, nevertheless proposed that different mental abilities were diverse, right? So it did have a little bit of um, utility. So the early kind of um, heyday of phrenology, this kind of early brain mapping, this is essentially saying that by studying the lumps on a skull, early scientists thought they could map out the brain, right? Which of course is not very accurate, uh, but did lead to the idea of the localization of brain functions or that different areas of the brain are responsible for different aspects of your personality as well as your body's functions. So when we kind of look at the heyday of uh, phrenology, there's an interesting case study that comes up. It's kind of this intersection of phrenology and Walt Whitman, who's a famous American author and poet. Uh, on July 16, 1849, uh, Walt Whitman went to the phrenological cabinet of Fowlers and Wells in New York City's Clinton Hall, and he sat for a phreno phrenological examination. Uh, Whitman as, um, was seen as strong in his animal will with large amativeness, self-esteem, and individuality. Um, and it didn't end there. After Whitman died, his brain was actually carted around by Dr. Uh, turned poet Henry Cattell, um, and he kind of used it as um, kind of an example of what a, an exceptional brain would look like or what a highly intelligent brain would look like. Um, his brain was actually later destroyed by a clumsy undergraduate at uh, New York's um, university. So it's kind of very interesting, um, you know, the story of Walt Whitman and how Walt Whitman kind of participated in the development and kind of perpetuation of this notion of phrenology and how you can uh, take those bumps on your brain and those measurements and determine distinct personality traits. So as we move into the 20th century with this uh, new kind of quote unquote science of measuring um, human skulls, what we really kind of culminated in was this notion of anthropometry or the notion of measuring human bodies, right? And the, this kind of um, encompasses all these different uh, aspects of measurement, right? Somatometry, osteometry or measuring bones, craniometry, measuring uh, your, your skull, uh, cephalometry, measuring the um, brain, as well as odontometry, measuring the teeth. The origin of this kind of, uh, you know, as we've been talking about, comes from these 18th century scholars and these 19th century scholars searching to prove monogenism versus polygenism. And the objectives of anthropometry today is to examine the differences between various species on the earth, to investigate the variation within species, which include temporal changes, um, you know, changes over time, sexual dimorphism, the difference between males and females in terms of body size and body proportions, and geographic and ethnic differences that we see based on climate. It's also meant to explore the trends and, and evolution, as well as to interpret the fossil records of our own existence. And it's to apply in clinical diagnosis, treatment planning, forensics, and other commercial applications as well. So this is just showing you there are two methods of measurement that we have for anthropometry. We have direct versus indirect. If we are doing the direct method, we're using our hand tools, things like our sliding calipers or a metric tape or a coordinate caliper um, or a, what we call a Todd's craniostat, which is something that kind of you see in the uh, movies and things when they're trying to measure someone's skull. Um, you also have indirect methods, things like digitizers or surface scanners or radiography, taking uh, CTs, MRIs and um, x-rays and things like that. I don't expect you to know all these different methods, just know that there are two kind of categories of ways to um, conduct anthropometric 
um, research. So this is just showing you a sliding caliper, a uh, non verniers versus a verniers caliper. Um, you really don't need to know the difference. I just want to kind of give you an idea of what the tools look like that anthropologists use to um, measure uh, different aspects of the human body. So showing you another type of caliper. This is a digital sliding caliper. This is a what's called a spreading caliper, right? This uh, helps you get circumference of things. So we also have a stadiometer, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, we actually still use these today. It's one of the oldest measurement tools uh, being invented in uh, 1779 or a little bit shortly before that. Um, and it's really interesting because when you go to the doctor and you get up on the scale and they bring that little bar down on top to measure your height, that is a stadiometer, right? It's trying to measure your stature. This is an osteometric board. It's another thing that's used to measure stature. Uh, most of the time, um, you're not putting live individuals in there. Um, you're actually um, measuring individual bones that we dig up in the field um, to determine. And there are certain calculations that you can use that um, using, you know, with just a couple of bones, you can actually determine how tall someone was, what their stature was, um, things like that. That's kind of outside the purview of this course. But um, if you do take an osteology class, they will cover um, stature measurements. This is telling you, this is looking at a Todd's craniostat, otherwise known as a head spanner. Of course, we have our soft metric tape. And of course, you have the uh, body imaging with 3D surface anthropometry. Um, this is kind of one of the old, older versions of the machines. Um, it's very large and clunky. They're actually a lot more smaller and handheld nowadays. Showing you the computerized image of uh, that individual who was just scanned. This is showing you some other 3D imaging that we use. Um, this is on uh, one is on an individual who re received blunt force trauma. Another is on um, an individual who received a gunshot wound to the head. So this leads us to craniometry, right? Which is the kind of um, scientific version of craniometry um, or, uh, you know, phrenology. So in essence, it's the measurement of the human dry skull, right? And it's important to note that your bones are actually um, kind of uh, soaked in fluid. In essence, you know, as they dry out, they'll shrink a little bit. They look at landmarks. They look at true landmarks on the skull versus relative landmarks. They look at mid-sagittal landmarks or landmarks that go down the middle as well as bilateral landmarks that occur on both sides of the skull. Um, they have qualitative measurements, which are non-metric versus quantitative uh, measurements, right? The metric measurements include angular, arc measurements, linear, volumetric, as well as proportional. I'm not going to expect you guys to know all this. I'm not going to test you on it. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how we measure human bodies today. So you have cranial and facial indices as well as cranial and facial forms, right? So we actually have categorization methods where we can categorize different facial forms across human populations as well as cranial and facial indices. So this is just showing you some of the traditional landmarks of the skull. I don't expect you all to know these. Um, but there are quite a few, right? So if you end up taking an anatomy class later on in your uh, collegiate career here, you're going to actually go over all of these little bumps and uh, crevices in great detail. These are the bilateral landmarks of the skull. These are the ones that are occurring um, on both sides of the skull on each side. This is showing you the Frankfurt horizontal plane, which is what we kind of call the traditional anatomical plane. It was developed in um, uh, Germany and adopted in 1877. It's an orientation of skull is in consistent and reproducible position, right? And that's important because when you're talking about anatomy, you want to be absolutely sure that, you know, you're talking about the same feature that everybody's looking at. So if you can orient the skull in a particular fashion and have that orientation uniform across all different studies, it tends to make your results a lot more valid. So this is just looking at the human skull in the lateral view. Each one of those little numbers is a feature or a landmark that you can look at. So showing you the frontal view of the skull, again, each one of those numbers um, on the left represents different landmarks as well as the numbers on the right represent landmarks as well. This is the basal view of the skull or viewing it from the bottom. Um, so again, every one of those numbers represents some sort of uh, landmark that can be seen on the skull. This is the drawing of a child at um, 
at birth and then at age one and age two, right? So this is showing you um, one of the good uses that we have of anthropometry is being able to figure out um, growth cycles for individual creatures, right? We can kind of get these growth patterns. We, by measuring lots and lots of humans at the age of five years old, we know, you know, what's the average size of a five-year-old. And, you know, then we can really determine if the child is undergrowing or overgrowing or if there's any cause for concern. This is showing you the different uh, craniometric measurements that you can have. There is an awful lot of them. So um, if you want, you can kind of um, look at them. I'm not going to test you on any of these. But this is just showing you there are tons and tons of different measurements that can be taken on the skull. Here's some of the skull frontal measurements that you can see, you know, the mid to front, um, as well as the facial measurements. Showing you some of those lateral measurements. Showing you the palatal measurements, right? This is not the bottom of your jaw. This is kind of the roof of your mouth. If you look at the orbital index, it's defined as the orbital height times 100 divided by the orbital breadth, right? So what we're really looking at here is trying to determine the kind of um, shape and size of your eye socket, otherwise known in anatomy as the orbit. We also have the nasal index looking at the nasal breadth times 100 divided by the nasal height, right? This is showing you kind of the um, uh, kind of width and length and overall area of your um, nasal cavity. You have other uh, nasal measurements as well, uh, leptorhini, um, mesorhini, as well as platyrhini. Then, of course, you have cranial index, right? This is kind of what uh, resulted out of the study of phrenology, right? This whole notion that we can kind of create an index or this kind of scale in which we find um, human skull sizes, which is true. Yes, there is variation and patterns within human skull size and shape, but those patterns do not, under any circumstances, relate to any type of notions of personality or intelligence. As a matter of fact, um, you know, I don't talk about it in this class. If you take my human evolution class, we talk about it. But one of the things that really destroyed the notion of intelligence and brain size, at least in modern time, is the discovery of um, the small little hobbit-like creature um, who was an ancestor of ours um, that lived off of the um, coast of um, Southeast Asia, basically lived in, uh, on the island of Java, right? And this very little um, specimen had uh, a kind of very tiny, small, chimp-sized brain, but was found with very complex stone tools. So we know that this little individual was making these stone tools. This um, Homo floresiensis is the scientific name for it, but we kind of colloquial, colloquially call it the hobbit. Um, but we know that this little Homo floresiensis was making these complex t tools that we see made with much larger brained Homo erectuses at the same time. Um, and this little Homo floresiensis had a brain about the size of a chimp, right? So this really goes to show you that brain and size and intelligence does not correlate, right? It is not the size of the brain that matters, but how that brain is organized. So, and then, of course, you have a cephalic index, which is using the internal measurements to kind of determine a um, brain size. Um, and this is kind of comes with a little bit of error um, in terms of, you know, measuring brain size because it's only really a best uh, guess at best. We have the facial index, which is looking at the variations that we see in the face. And you're looking at, in this picture, you can see kind of the different face types that we see amongst human populations, right? Going from very wide faces to very thin faces, right? And we find each of these kind of facial categories within human populations as well. So it's not delineated based on race. It's not delineated based on what ethnicity you are. Um, really, this is just part of the wide degree of variation that we see in our species. So let's take a quick look at sex and gender estimation within um, basically looking at skulls. Um, these are kind of the sex and gender differences that we do see in the skull. Um, I'm not going to expect you to know these. Um, one of the big ones is, uh, or one of the kind of the general patterns that we see is since men tend to be a little bit larger in body size than women on average, we do have slightly more um, what we call robust skull features or our features of the skull are a little bit thicker than in women's skulls. So this is just showing you the difference between a male and female skull. 
the female skull being on the left hand side and the male skull being on the right hand side. So you can kind of see how the male skull is a little bit larger and a little bit, you know, the features are a little more exaggerated. This is looking at the skull of an infant, which makes, you know, uh, that's why kind of doing age determination in infants is very difficult. Um, we really try to look for how closed are the sutures at the top of the skull, right? Uh, whether or not they still have that soft spot in the skull. Um, these all kind of give us indications of what age the infant may be. It also lets us look at temporal changes, right? This is infant versus adult skull. Right, so you can see there's a fair degree of change that occurs throughout the course of an individual's lifetime in terms of uh, size comparison and proportional comparison. And we don't really see a whole lot of ethnic or um, racial differences, right? You kind of see a little bit of a difference in the shape of the skull, but nothing that really corresponds to differences in intelligence, nothing that really corresponds to really much difference at all. And we find those kind of different skull types within those populations as well, right? So there's really no kind of overall pattern to quote ethnic or racial uh, differences in skulls. But we do see differences between uh, species, right? If we look at just kind of the right-hand view here, um, we see an Australopithecus afarensis, right? That's what we classically know as our little Lucy. And then you have your Homo erectus, it's the first or the second member of our genus. And then of course you have the Homo sapien. So you can see in a general sense, all those skulls actually in terms of their overall uh, you know, shape tend to look pretty um, similar, right? Really the only difference between a Homo sapien skull and an Australopithecus afarensis skull is a little bit of changes that occurred because the skull grew in size because our brains grew over time, right? And then of course looking at um, some of the other apes on the left here, we have a female gorilla and a uh, female chimpanzee. Just going to show you that that whole issue of using facial prognathism to tell you know, different intelligences, thus different evolutionary stages that we saw in some of these 18th and 19th century scientists is absolutely ridiculous, right? Even from Australopithecus afarensis to Homo sapiens, you don't see a huge degree of difference. And that dif difference begins to decrease over time dramatically with each, you know, major evolutionary trend in our uh, evolutionary family tree. So this is showing you the cranial view of the three individuals, right? We have a robust Australopithecine and a gracile Australopithecine, so both members of the same genus. Um, and we have an early Homo erectus, right? This is going to show you that the skull sizes, yes, they changed in size a little bit, but in terms of general overall shape, uh, our skull sizes are very similar to other members of our um, primate genus. This is showing you that same comparison from the backside. So the question is, is it all doom and gloom, right? Is there any purpose for anthropometry or measuring skulls in uh, modern science, right? Well, we have anthropometry, which refers to the measurement of the human individual, right? And this is really done now for the purposes of understanding human physical variation, as well as looking at the fossil record in paleoanthropology. We now measure with an aim at illuminating the connectedness of all human populations rather than trying to point out the differences, right? So by understanding this connectedness, we can really winnow out the cause of any differences that we do see within human populations. So to give you an example of that, we have a study from 1979 that I am actually very familiar with because the individual that conducted the study sat on my thesis committee. Um, it's uh, Dr. Richard Mindel from the University of Massachusetts who now teaches at Kent State University. Um, what he did is he worked on a study for the Air Force because the Air Force recognized a big problem that they had. Their fighter jets were only made for a certain size person and people, Americans in particular, were getting taller over time. Right, so some of these older jets they had made, you know, during World War II and shortly thereafter were actually um, dangerous for modern age pilots. Right? What would happen is they would, um, if they had to do an emergency, uh, you know, ejection, which they do as part of, you know, regular training, um, some of those uh, individuals were actually shattering their kneecaps or in some of the worst cases cutting their kneecaps completely off during that um, ejection sequence because of you know the cockpit being just slightly too small um, for them so what Dr. Mindel did is he went and he measured the average heights and femur length for um, all of the Air Force pilots and he um, 
you know, when they went to go make the F-16 Lockheed Martin fighter, um, in essence, they used his study as the kind of map or the blueprint for how they created the cockpits, right? So it really goes to show you anthropometry does have a purpose today, right? It can be used for, um, you know, industrial purposes. Um, it can be used for defense purposes. It can be used for, um, you know, determining what we really have in terms of connectedness between various groups of human populations. You know, as a science that really kind of started out with kind of a really bad racist and nasty history, it did turn into something that is quite useful for our society. As long as we don't take those measurements and try to make absurd assertions like we can say that someone's, you know, level of intelligence is based on their uh, skull size and there go their brain size, right? So anthropometry does have purpose in our modern society. It's just we have to be careful on how it's applied and we have to be careful and really realize, you know, what is valid in terms of what we can say about these measurements and what we can't say.